a minute to get everybody together and for me to get us live on uh, YouTube here. Thanks for joining us on this afternoon. Minutes to oh, get everybody. Yeah. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Still see some people tuning in here. Welcome. All right, seem to be leveling out. Great. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Michelle Jewell. I'm the science communicator here at the Department of Applied Ecology based at NC State here in Raleigh, North Carolina in the US. And I'm joined today by Ben Reading and Linnea Anderson. We're in the lab and they have, uh, are they hybrid striped bass guys or are they just normal striped bass? Striped bass. These are straight striped bass. Great. Great. So they've got their straight bass today that they're going to be dissecting for us. And Ben here is a uh, professor in the Department of Applied Ecology. Linnea is his PhD candidate student slash student, whichever way you want to go with it. Um, and they have been working uh, with all sorts of striped bass research in the, for the past many years. And uh, we are really excited to have them join us for this live stream and take us through all of the different bits of a striped bass. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Ben and Linnea. Oh, oh actually one more ado. Um, as you have questions, please do put them in the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, you can throw them in the chat there too. And as you have them, I'll uh, be stopping Ben and Linnea every once in a while and asking your questions live. So please do put them in the Q&A or the chat or whichever box you have in front of you that you can put some text in. All right, without any further ado after that, please, Ben Linnea, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as, uh, as Michelle said, I'm a professor at uh, NC State University, and we do a lot of work on striped bass, <clears throat> um, in particular looking at the biology of fish, how they work, and what they're made of, and what they look like. And uh, I also teach a class on biology of fishes, uh, where we look at anatomy and taxonomy of fish. And so to begin with, uh, this here is a striped bass that you can see. And I'm going to go over some of the, uh, the features that allow us to, to know that this is a striped bass and also to, to understand the taxonomy of, of this fish. So, uh, for instance, I can tell you that this is an advanced, what we call advanced persiform fish. And so to begin with, <clears throat> if we look at the dorsal fin, and so I'll introduce a couple of uh, an anatomy terms here. So uh, the back side of a fish here is what we call dorsal. Uh, and then the, the belly side of the fish is what we call ventral. So dorsal, ventral. And another term uh, that we're going to introduce is a pair called anterior and posterior. Anterior towards the head, posterior towards the tail. And I, I want to introduce these terms right now because when I explain some of the anatomy here, I'm going to be using those terms. Uh, also, what we have is the side of the fish is what we call lateral. So lateral, dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. And so if, Lenny, if you could pull this dorsal fin up, again, it's dorsal. It's called a dorsal fin because it's on the dorsal aspect of the fish. Uh, in the case of the, of the striped bass, we've actually got what we call a paired dorsal fin. So uh, the fin is actually separated. It's not connected here. There's a, uh, the, the, the two fins are, are separated. This fin here is close to the head. So we call this the anterior dorsal fin. Uh, this fin here is close to the tail. So we call it the posterior dorsal fin. And one of the key features here of a striped bass and other fish in the same genus, uh, the scientific Latin name for this fish is uh, Morone saxatilis. It is in family Moronidae. And uh, members of this family have very sharp, hard spines here in this anterior dorsal fin. So anyone who's gone fishing and caught a fish and are trying to take that fish off the hook, you're always being cautious of this dorsal fin because the striped bass, like many other advanced persiforms, like the largemouth bass or the bluegill, have very sharp spines here. And this is sort of a defense. So as much as the fish might put these spines out to catch your hand, uh, they also put those spines out if another fish is trying to eat them. So it's a defensive mechanism. These are very sharp, 
And oftentimes, in the case of this striped bass, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six hard spines. And then there's a separate uh, gap here between them, that what we call the soft rayed dorsal, uh, the posterior dorsal fin. And in this case, we do have one sharp spine here uh, on the anterior margin of it. But these are actually soft rays, is what we call them. They're not sharp, they're not pointy, they're not like needles. These are literally like needles. <clears throat> and so we can tell then the fact that the dorsal fin here has sharp spines in it, this is an advanced fish. Uh, a fish like a salmon, for instance, has all soft rays. They don't have any sharp spines. And so this is one of the first features we can look at to say this is an advanced fish. And also a diagnostic characteristic of the striped bass. Another characteristic of striped bass in particular are, it's called a striped bass. It has lateral stripes on the side of its body. And again, this is the lateral surface of the fish. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, looks like seven uh, stripes on the side of this fish here. And generally speaking, these stripes extend the entire length of the body of the fish. Every now and then you'll see a broken stripe like this one. Uh, that happens naturally. Uh, for instance, if this fish is perhaps injured uh, and the scales regrow, sometimes it'll offset the stripe, but this is completely natural as part of the biology and the variation of the fish. So that's one of the key features there in particular of a striped bass, hence its name. Another fin that we can look at, <clears throat> for instance, is the anal fin here. This is called the anal fin because the anus of the fish is located right here. And in, in an advanced fish, the first one, two, and three uh, supports for the anal fin are hard spines that are sharp, just like the dorsal fin. And the remaining supports for the anal fin are soft rays. And so another feature that this is an advanced fish. When we look at the, the overall body shape of this fish, it's got a, a, a generalist uh, kind of appearance. It looks like a typical fish. So we can sort of say this is a, a generalist uh, just by the shape of the body and also uh, by the shape of what we call the caudal fin. So the anterior portion of the fish is the head, the posterior portion of the fish is the tail, but the actual anatomical definition here is caudal fin and a caudal peduncle. That's the actual anatomical definition of those features on a fish. So here's our, our what we call caudal fin, and we can sort of see that in this case, it's what we call slightly forked. So there's a slight forking here on the caudal fin. Uh, and so this is uh, how we would describe that uh, feature of the striped bass. Another feature that the striped bass has, um, if we look here at this, let me tap this for a second. You can hear that, that is a hard bony plate. And this is called the operculum. And what this does is underneath here are the gills. And the gills are very delicate structures involved in gas exchange. And so this bony plate actually provides armor to protect that fish. And in the case of a striped bass, it has a sharp spine here on the operculum that also can cut you if you're handling these fish. So that's another feature specific to the striped bass. Um, we look at some of these other fins. Uh, I'd like to point out two additional ones. Linnea, yeah, you can hold up this one first. <clears throat> there are a pair of fins down here. Uh, on the ventral aspect of the fish. And we call these the pelvic fins. Um, and the reason why we call them pelvic fins is they are analogous to your legs as a terrestrial animal. Uh, the bone structures that support these two fins are in fact the equivalent of your pelvis. So when you look at the fish, the legs of a fish are right here, these pelvic fins. Um, this is an advanced fish, uh, meaning that the pelvic fins are often closely associated with these pectoral fins. And the pectoral fin is analogous to your arm. So this fin here is equivalent of your arms. And the bony structures that support that fin is the, is the equivalent of your shoulders. So the arms and shoulders of the fish are here, the legs and the pelvis of the fish are here. An advanced fish is gonna have very close placements of the, pe the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin. Uh, less derived fish like a salmonid, these pelvic fins are gonna be placed posterior towards the tail on the body of the fish. So maybe closer to this location here, less close to the uh, pectoral fin location. So another feature of an advanced fish. 
Uh, and again, these structures are conserved in other uh, terrestrial animals, such as human beings. When we look at the, the mouth of the fish, this uh, also is another feature of an advanced fish. So if we sort of hold this fish up, if we sort of hold this fish up, we can see the mouth structures here. This is an advanced jaw. Uh, uh, striped bass and other advanced fishes, such as a largemouth bass, have very well defined and formed what we call uh, jaw features. And so this part of the jaw is called the mandible. And this part of the jaw here is called the premaxilla, this bone right here. And this bone here that comes down is called the maxilla. And what this jaw is designed to do is when the fish's mouth is closed, the mouth is, is, it's got a very small gape, it's closed. But when this fish opens its mouth, the mandible swings down, the, the maxilla swings forward, and then this premaxilla comes out. And so the, the mouth of that fish is quite wide. Uh, and so what that tells us is it's an advanced fish with this design of a jaw, as well as a fish that eats other fish because the, the large mouth then allows it to eat uh, items such as prey items, uh, other fishes. In some cases, the striped bass will eat squid and crustaceans as well. But this is, a, this is a predator or a carnivore. So I can tell that just by looking at the jaw structures of that fish. So Lenny, if you want to open and close the jaw a few times, you can get a good shot of this. Um, that's how the advanced jaw of a fish operates, right? And so also it's at uh, uh, what we call um, on the head there, uh, advanced jaw. Um, <clears throat> other features here, if we open up this operculum, we can sort of see the uh, gills underneath there that are being protected. And so in this particular case, the gill is this pink tissue right here. And it's supported by a bony, what we call gill arch. And when we get further into the dissection here, we will actually cut these out. Uh, and these sort of teeth-like structures here are hard. These are what we call gill rakers. And they're involved in uh, feeding. This is involved in gas exchange, uh, of taking oxygen from the environment, and then also releasing carbon dioxide. So that's the inside of the opercular, uh, inside of the operculum in what we call the opercular cavity. And that is the, the gill structures there of the fish. And so with that, I believe those are the majority of our external features. I've got one more to actually point out here. Fish, uh, especially advanced fish such as the striped bass, is a very unique uh, sensory system. And uh, what I'll talk about here is the lateral line. So inside of the skull of the fish are stones in the inner ear that allow the fish to hear just like you would. Uh, you have stones in your head as well that, that transmit uh, sound waves in, in your brain that interprets that as sound in your ear. And so fish have that as well, but because the density of water is very similar to the density of the fish's tissues, they have another ability to hear. And this is called the lateral line or the acoustical lateralis. And this is a system of pores that are located all along the head and then also down the side of the fish. And in the case of the striped bass, this lateral line extends all the way down the, the side of the striped bass out into the caudal peduncle. And what this is, is a series of canals uh, that allow sound waves to penetrate into the side of the fish. And so not only do they hear, they can feel that sound. So imagine if you could actually feel sound uh, in, in a manner that is different than you just hearing it with your ears. Anyone who's tried to chase a fish around in a tank with a net, you always see how the fish is ahead of you. It's because it can actually feel you moving that net through the water. And so it knows to swim away from it. It doesn't need to see that. It can actually feel you moving that net through the water using this acoustical lateralis. And this is a very advanced system that fishes such as the striped bass use to avoid predators and also to detect prey. So with that, I think we're done with our external features. And so Linnea has already prepared this fish. We have cut away a window on the side of the animal. And the way you dissect a fish uh, is oftentimes you insert a pair of scissors or a, 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 a scalpel 
into the, the anus or the urogenital general vent. And then you cut the ventral aspect of that fish up to this uh, pelvic girdle. And we don't cut through here because there's a lot of bones in here. Because again, it's the equivalent of your pelvis. We then cut up here to the dorsal aspect of the fish. And then we cut along here to the posterior aspect of the fish. And then we cut this piece out. This is the proper way to dissect the fish. And what we see then are the internal organs. And so I will tell you that this fish is in fact a female. So this organ right here is the gonad. That is an ovary and it's fully loaded with eggs. So when we talk about striped bass, the biology of a striped bass is that it is very similar to a Pacific salmon. Uh, these things are native to the east coast of the United States. They live in the Atlantic Ocean. And like a salmon, they live their adult lives in the ocean. And then in the spring, they migrate into freshwater rivers to spawn. Now, this fish is naturally preparing for that spring spawning migration. In the latitude of North Carolina, striped bass typically spawn somewhere in the, around April to May. And so this female is getting her eggs ready for the spawning run this spring, because it is now February. And so th th those are uh, what we call yoked oocytes. And so this fish is actually preparing for that spawning run. That particular life history of uh, living in the ocean and then returning to freshwater rivers is kind of a unique life history. And it's what we call anadromous. So fishes that do this are called anadromous fishes. And it's kind of rare, actually. Most fishes do not do this. Also, it means that this fish can tolerate both full strength salt water as well as fresh water, which is a pretty unique characteristic. Most fishes don't do that. I'm gonna say less than 2% of the fishes on the earth are able to do that. So it's a very unique animal in that regard. So this sausage shaped uh, organ here is the ovary. You can see that there is a, a very good what we call a vascular system. All these, these red lines here are, are blood vessels that supply uh, oxygenated blood and nutrients to this organ. Um, and then inside of it, if we can get the forceps, um, yeah, that will work, thank you. If we can get these out, we can sort of see some of these oocytes. These are gonna be what will be, the, the fish will lay these then as eggs. And really it's just a little, uh, uh, these yellow oocytes there. And um, you can't really see them without a microscope because these things, the diameter is gonna be much less than a millimeter in diameter at this age, at this stage of, of reproduction. So really it's more like a granular kind of tissue. If we wanna uh, cut this with a scalpel and then we can sort of show maybe the lamellae inside of there. Now, there we go. And so inside of this sausage shaped ovary are then these, these clutches of eggs. Uh, well, actually they're technically oocytes. They will be laid as eggs when they're ovulated, but really at this stage, they're sort of just uh, a very tiny preparing to be ovulated again, in the spring coming up. So this is a female, that is an ovary, is what that structure is. While Linnea is uh, dissecting out the next organ, I'll show you all uh, another structure that we can use as a indicator of whether this fish is advanced or not. If I go and take my forceps and pull a scale off the side of this fish, this scale, is going to be somewhat rough to the touch. Um, and it's going to be rough because of these microscopic little needle-like projections on it that are called tenai. And um, because this scale has these tenai, it's what we call a tenoid scale. And that is another feature of an advanced fish. So uh, along with the hard dorsal spines uh, on the anterior portion of the fin, and the other structures I've talked about, in particular the jaw, the presence of a tenoid scale also is an indicator that this is a very derived fish. So uh, another way of saying that is, is evolutionarily, it's, it's far advanced, it's been specialized. And so Linnea is coming uh, and dissecting out now the intestines uh, of this uh, animal. And in this particular case, uh, I indicated also that the, um, 
the, the striped bass is primarily a carnivore. Uh, it's a it's a piscivore. It eats other fishes and other other animals. It does not eat uh, plant materials. And so a trend in fishes uh, is that the higher trophic uh, that that animal feeds, meaning a carnivore is, is, is an apex predator, it's going to be feeding other animals, the shorter the intestine compared to say uh, an herbivore or a detritivore, a fish that eats plant matter or uh, filter feeding uh, off the bottom, uh, the, the lower the trophic level, the longer the intestine. And so this striped bass, in addition to looking at its jaw and seeing that it's a predator, we can look at its intestine and see that it's actually not very long. Literally, this is it. It's not very long and coiled. It literally goes from the mouth to the stomach that Linnea is trying to get at. And then literally, this intestine then would attach there to the anus. And that is the length of the intestine of the striped bass. This, this material here, this white cream colored material here is actually a visceral fat. It's adipose tissue that sometimes associates then with the uh, mesenteries of the intestine. Now, this intestine is filled with contents, gut contents. <clears throat> in this particular case, this fish was raised in a tank and <clears throat> it was fed a prepared diet. This fish was what we call cultured in captivity. Um, uh, another way of saying this is it was aquaculture. And so the contents of this gut actually do not include any natural diet. For instance, uh, insects or other fish. It's really a prepared diet. And once Linnea gets the stomach out, we'll show you what those feed pellets look like, the prepared diet. Also associated here with the, uh, the gut is this, this spleen that Linnea has dissected out. The spleen's oftentimes this kind of cherry colored organ. Uh, and the spleen is associated with the, uh, the digesta or the digestive system. And here is then this intestine, again, more uh, adipose tissue here associated um, with the intestine here. And this is where the intestine then attaches to this structure is the stomach. And actually the stomach looks uh, very similar to other, other vertebrate animals as far as the structure. I mean, the idea here is food comes in the mouth through the esophagus and then it's stored in the stomach where it uh, undergoes the initial stages of digestion. And so Linnea is gonna dissect then this intestine off of the stomach, and you can sort of see here are some of the uh, the digesta, um, which is the essentially the contents of the intestine. So this is partially digested uh, fish pellets. We'll move this adipose tissue aside. And so if we just take this stomach, Linnea, and cut this open, we're gonna see what this fish ate uh, yesterday, probably. And you're gonna hey, see- Yes. While Linnea, Linnea is doing that, I have a question for you. Um, yes. From Mark, who would like to know, uh, how do you determine if a female fish has already spawned? Very good question. What you would see if the female fish had already spawned, let me bring this ovary back out. So this is a nice, what we call a yellow ovary. In the case of a striped bass, the ovary uh, is going to contain these oocytes that are uh, either yellow or in some cases green. Even. And uh, if the fish has already spawned, it's going to contain not, the ovary is not going to be nearly as big. So this sausage shaped organ, here's an und, un, undissected one. I'm going to say it's usually for a fish this size, it's about the size of your thumb. If this fish has already spawned, this structure is going to be much, much smaller. And because these are, are what we call heavily yolked oocytes, they're going to contain this nice yellow color because that's the, the color of egg yolk. Uh, just like a chicken egg yolk is yellow. Uh, the fish egg yolk is similar and actually, to be honest, very similar in structure to a chicken egg yolk. And so the oocytes, the ovary will not be as big and it will be smaller. And also oftentimes it will be more of a whitish color. It'll be like a, a drab white and not this nice yellow. And it will be much smaller. And in some cases, if it's a very recently spawned fish, it will be like a deflated balloon where you'll see that like it used to be big, but then all those eggs were removed from it when it spawned. And so it will look like kind of like a withered uh, deflated balloon in structure. And so it will not contain all this in there because this fish spawns once per year. And when it does, it will release all the eggs that it grew for that year. 
And so once it spawns out, as we say, uh, this structure will become kind of a vacant sac, if you will. And are you going to be talking a little bit about how you age these fish later on? Um, a little bit. We, we, we have to get the uh, otoliths yeah. out of the head, possibly. That's and what I thought. We, yes. We, we, All we, right. we, we, if we can grab one. Yes. We'll Perfect. Get Excellent. Anything else? That's it for now. Carry on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Look at this. This is what's for dinner. All right. So, Leanne. Do we have the, the scalpel or the, yeah, there you go. We can lay a couple of these on there. So aquacultured fish have these, what we call prepared diets that we feed them. These are actually pellets of food. And you can sort of see that the fish never got done digesting these pellets. And so if you were to say, catch this fish from the wild, you wouldn't see something like this in the stomach because this is obviously uh, someone was feeding this fish, a human being was. But these fish pellets, uh, these feed pellets, are, are they're, they're manufactured just like uh, companies like Purina manufacture uh, a diet for like your dog or your cat. And so oftentimes the fish food or the fish pellets, they're very similar to like say cat food. It usually consists of ground up fish and other kinds of protein, uh, blood meal and uh, other kinds of things that are going into this. And it's, it's uh, pelletized through an extrusion process, very similar to how they make cat food and dog food. Um, and so this is a, a or, or cereal, for instance, Cheerios are made in a similar fashion with ground up oats. And so these pellets are then thrown into the tank and then the fish will eat them. Um, and so you can sort of see that this stomach is entirely loaded with these feed pellets. This, this fish had a, a last supper, uh, was very good, I'm gonna say. Um, and so look at all these feed pellets are in the stomach here. And if we can scrape some of these out, um, they're undigested for the most part. And I just want to show this, because uh, this stomach is big enough, we can sort of see. The inside of the stomach, the lining of the stomach, looks very similar to that of another animal. It's sort of got these ridges on it, like that. It's sort of wrinkly looking. Uh, and then the stomach uh, secretes a variety of different digestive enzymes, and has the pH uh, not nearly as low as, say, a human being's stomach, which is very acidic. But it's got a, 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 a whole suite of chemicals that it helps to secrete to then help digest this, this material that's inside of the stomach. Uh, when you look at biologists, a lot of times if you catch a fish from the wild, they'll do what are called uh, um, uh, digestive studies or they'll do diet content studies where they'll actually cut open the stomach of a fish that they caught in the wild to see what that fish had been eating. And so, um, for instance, you might find partially digested uh, fish, and that indicates that, for instance, your fish has been eating other fish. Um, an interesting one, actually, is if you cut open the stomach of a wild fish and uh, they're eating insects, many times the exoskeletons of insects uh, are very hard to digest. And so you can actually look at the body parts of the insects inside of the stomach of a fish and you can then identify what particular insects that fish might have been eating. So a lot of times biologists will look at the stomach contents of a fish that they've captured from the wild to help better understand what that fish is naturally eating. Um, and so people do look at stomach contents of fish. Uh, it's, it's actually a field of, of study. And a quick question on that from Brianna here. So with those bits that are a little bit harder to break down, do they, are they able to actually break down those bits or do they, you know, puke them back up? Like how do they deal with bones and things like that that are really tough to digest? Good, 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 good call there. Uh, good question. Um, most of the time the fish will not regurgitate things. Uh, it, they'll usually end up passing that through the intestine, for instance, and out through the anus uh, if, if, it, if it's undigestible. Um, the exoskeletons of insects, for instance, oftentimes are comprised of things like chitin and other, other odd polymers that if there are uh, a way to digest those things, oftentimes it is digested um, by enzymes produced by bacteria inside of the intestine. So if, even if the stomach can't break it down with enzymes produced by the fish itself, sometimes there's a little bit of help there from bacteria that live in the intestine. In a similar way, uh, a, a terrestrial animal such as a human being is going to help 
that is going to have bacteria in it, its gut, that will help it break down things like fiber, uh, which is mostly cellulose. And so um, anything that has an intestine like this, we usually have bacteria that sort of help us along digesting certain things. In the case of the fish, the same. And so bones, for instance, also might be broken down uh, by digestive processes, including some enzymes produced in the stomach as well as in the gut. And if it's a large enough bone or something like that, then it might be passed through. But fish bones are very small, to be honest, um, very uh, uh, needle-like as far as the, the, the heaviness of the skeleton. So they're very, not, not necessarily soft, but they're, they're, they're not like heavy bones, like say in a terrestrial animal. And so if it's not digested, it'll be passed out, but there's usually some way that some of those things can be broken down. Thanks, Ben. Yep. And so <clears throat> that's the intestine and the breakdown there, the, the digestive processes. These are all great questions. I will say that in some cases, really in, in the case of bones, the reason why <clears throat> the intestine of, of a carnivore like a striped bass is short, right? And so if we take this intestine up, we can sort of say, this and the length of this intestine is actually less than the length of the fish. And that's because despite bones and things like that being somewhat difficult to digest, it's nowhere near as difficult to digest actually as plant matter. Uh, plant cells are very tough. And so a uh, herbivorous fish is going to contain an intestine that's going to be 10 times as long as this, for instance, because it's going to need to have all this extra time that it stays inside of the fish as it's passing down it to give things like bacteria the ability to break down those uh, cellulose uh, cell walls and things like that. And so really, we don't think about plant matter as being tough, but really inside of an animal, plant matter is pretty tough stuff. And so it does require quite a bit of ability to digest it. And so that's sort of what people also do is you can measure the length of an intestine of a fish and you can sort of estimate then what the diet is uh, comprised of. In this particular case, when the intestine is less than the length of the fish, it's almost always a carnivore. So pretty cool. These are like little things you can look at. Um, <clears throat> another structure that we'll talk about here that's associated with digestion is the liver. Now the liver, Linnea got this liver out. Uh, it's usually up here, right behind, I'd say, this uh, uh, pectoral fin. And so this is a liver right here. And this liver, uh, it sort of depends on the, the species of fish and also the what we call the health or the condition of the fish. But this liver is sort of a pinkish uh, brown color. In some cases, a very well-fed fish might be a, a lighter tan color. To some instances, maybe even yellow, but uh, most fishes in the wild do not have a yellow liver. They usually have what's, what we call a liver like this is a very good color liver. You want this like kind of pinkish, pinkish hue to a, a tan color. This is a very good liver right here. In, it just so happens that this liver here, there's an organ associated with this called the gallbladder. And so just like a human being has a gallbladder to help break down and emulsify fats in the intestine, the liver has a gallbladder associated with it in the fish as well. And so I've got one here that's pre-dissected, I'll show you. But really this liver will attach to the intestine right there at that gallbladder. And so when the fish eats food, it will dump the gallbladder uh, contents into the intestine. Now, this fish just recently ate all these pellets. So most likely we can't see the gallbladder in this fish because it has just eaten. But we do have a pre-dissected gallbladder here <clears throat> from another fish. And really this is just a sac that contains this kind of greenish fluid. Uh, and this greenish fluid is called bile. And uh, bile is a breakdown products of things like red blood cells and this kind of stuff. And uh, basically it's produced and acts like a detergent in the intestine and helps to emulsify fats and absorb fats from the diet. And so this particular fish here, you can see this sac, this is all the bile that has leaked out of this, uh, this gallbladder, but it's usually always associated somewhere with the liver and it then is attached to the intestine. It's also why the intestine in this particular case, these feed pellets are kind of a tan color, but the gut contents can appear uh, greenish uh, because of the presence of bile. So bile oftentimes is what gives feces uh, the color that it has, a, a greenish brown color oftentimes comes from the, the, the gallbladder. Is that the gallbladder mm -hmm. from this one? 
So the gallbladder from this particular fish, probably because it just recently ate a big meal, uh, has got no uh, bile in it. And that's because one of the things that happens after uh, an organism eats is oftentimes the gallbladder will dump its contents into the intestine. So we can't, and so we got the, the gallbladder from another fish. And so the liver uh, is involved in helping to digest things. Also in the case of fish, this is a storage center for uh, things like uh, carbohydrates, uh, glycogen, things like that. And really this is the sort of what we call powerhouse of the body. Lots of energetics and metabolism is controlled by the liver in a fish, just like it is in a, in a human being. Now, people who have taken anatomy before are gonna go, well, wait a minute, you're missing one. Where, where's the pancreas? Well, it's an interesting question. A liver or the pancreas of a fish is not an organ. Um, so somewhere in this mess that we dug out of this fish, in these intestines and stomach and things like this, somewhere mixed in with all of this is a diffuse set of tissues called a Brockman body. And the Brockman body contains the uh, endocrine aspect of the pancreas, which is involved in producing insulin and regulating blood glucose. But there is no distinct pancreas as an organ. It's literally just a diffuse set of tissues uh, that produce insulin. So the fish doesn't have a pancreas proper as an organ. However, it does have tissues that do that function. So when you dissect a fish and you're like, where's the pancreas? You're not the only person. They don't have one per se. They do have tissues that do that, but just not a distinct organ that does that. So <clears throat> uh, an interesting one, I'll bring back one last comment here on the spleen. And also Michelle's question about bones of a fish. Uh, because one of the next things we're going to talk about is the kidney. Uh, fish live in water, and water uh, is very dense compared to air. And so things that, that we have to deal with as a terrestrial animal, like gravity, we have to have very heavy bones to resist the pull of the earth. If you're living in water, if you contain things like fat or air in your body, you actually are more buoyant than the water because fat, for instance, is less dense than water. And so you float. Because fish live in water, they don't really have to have a very heavy skeleton. It's a very, what we call fine skeleton. Really, all it is is a series of anchoring points for muscles. So that's why skeletons of fish are very, like, I would say even delicate, if you will, compared to, say, a skeleton of a human being. And because the bones are very small, fish do not have bone marrow, right? The bones are not hollow uh, and containing a marrow that produces things like blood cells. You know, a human being, for instance, has these very heavy bones, like a femur in your leg. It's hollow and filled with marrow that produces blood, right? That's where your blood comes from. Not in the case of a fish. In the case of a fish, the spleen is a primary site of blood storage of a fish, which is why it's got this nice dark color, this cherry red color. And in some cases, it's involved in a little bit of blood formation, really more maturation of the blood cells. The blood of a fish is not formed in the bones. It's actually formed in what we call the head kidney. So the anterior portion of the kidney is where blood is formed in the fish, not inside of the bones, because the bones are very light and they don't contain marrow. So when we look at buoyancy, water density, and how a fish can live in the water, one of the things it does is it regulates its buoyancy with a structure that we call the swim bladder. So Linnea is going to show you here, look at this. You see this sack of air right here on the back of the fish, all right? We've taken all the internal organs out of this fish, and now there's this, this, this literally a sack of air. It's actually not air. It's actually, in this particular case, this is an advanced fish. So this sac contains pure molecular oxygen. Um, another advanced feature here of this fish is it's what we call a physoclystis fish. This swim bladder does not attach to the esophagus. There's a special gland here that actually pulls oxygen out of the blood and deposits it straight into this, what we call swim bladder. And because gas is less dense than air. This allows the fish to control its points. So when is going to pop this swim bladder and see it deflated there, and then we can open this up. And this tells us then 
what's on the inside of here. So all the organs sit ventral to this sac. And if we open this swim bladder up, we can see this is the backbone of the fish. This is the vertebral column. So if we roll the fish on its side again, so we can show the lateral side. The spine of the fish is really gonna run somewhere like here. This is all gonna be meat, this is all muscle. This is empty where the visceral organs are. This is where the swim bladder is. And then the, the vertebral column is right around here. So we can roll them back up. And running along either side of the spinal column are these kind of dark red lines. Maybe this fish here, we can see a little better. That one that we cleared out. I just want to grab him for a moment. This one that we prepared previous. These dark red lines here are the kidneys of the fish. And this is our anterior end, posterior end. The anterior end of the kidney, what we call the head kidney, is where blood formation occurs, right up here. And then the posterior end of the kidney is where osmoregulation occurs. So uh, the kidney of a fish is not like a kidney in a human being. Uh, your kidney, for instance, helps filter things out like urine. Uh, in the case of a, of a fish, actually, the, most of the urine comes out in the gill. Uh, they don't actually even produce urine. They usually excrete ammonia. But the kidney is involved in water balance. So uh, making sure that this fish has the right uh, uh, water balance inside of the body. So this is what we call osmoregulation uh, is water balance and then blood formation here in the head kidney. And so sometimes you'll hear people like seafood people talk about removing the bloodline of a fish. It's really the removal of the kidney. If this is not a bloodline, this is literally the organ known as the kidney. So here, put this one back on here. Thank you, Lene. So that is the kidney on the inside then of the swim lab. Ben, quick question for you. Yes. From a familiar name, John Davis is asking, uh, if a fish is in a low oxygen environment, how does that affect the volume or the contents of the swim bladder? Very good. All right. So if you're in a, in a low oxygen environment, uh, you know, the, the fish could theoretically pull oxygen out of that swim bladder. Um, if it needed to. Um, and that's a, it's an interesting question. I don't really know how many people have been studying uh, the effects of low oxygen on the ability for a physocleist to, for instance, uh, control its buoyancy. I will say that because gas is such a, I mean, by definition, it's, it's such a low density compound, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a state of matter. You don't really actually need to fill the swim bladder uh, with a whole lot of oxygen um, by like, say, uh, molecular composition. So like, you don't need to put a lot of moles of oxygen into a space for it to then expand on its own, right? So if you take a balloon, for instance, you know, one breath of, of lung full of air is gonna pretty much inflate that balloon but if you look at the actual number of molecules of oxygen inside of that, it's, it's not really like a lot. But it'd be interesting to see, uh, you know, as far as a fish responding to a low oxygen environment, uh, a physocleist is gonna fill this swim bladder with uh, oxygen from the blood. A physostome, such as say a salmon or a salmonid, the swim bladder actually attaches to the esophagus. So these things will actually fill their swim bladder by gulping at the surface. So for some fishes like that, the dissolved oxygen in the water is not going to affect buoyancy at all because they literally go to the surface to gulp air, if you will, and, and fill this bladder with it and then belch it out. The one thing that you will see a major change in when you see dissolved oxygen, if it's not the swim bladder, it is this guy right here. I'll bring the spleen back out. This spleen, is actually filled with red blood cells. And so if the fish goes into a low oxygen environment, it will literally dump all the stored red blood cells in this spleen out into the blood. And a fish can actually double its hematocrit almost in a matter of minutes by dumping out the red blood cells in there. So that's primarily the major response you see 
uh, in a fish that goes into what we call low oxygen, or in other words, a hypoxic environment. It's usually what we call the splenic reaction. And that usually uh, does the job because the more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can pull out of the environment, the more efficient you are. And so that's usually the strategy that the fish is gonna use first before it would say, try to rob oxygen out of its own swim blood. So Oh, sorry, Ben. I've got a digest, completely unrelated digestive question for you as well. Yes. Uh, from Mark, curious. So say a fish swallows a fish hook. What happens then? Very good. <clears throat> so most of the time, actually, this is actually a pretty good segue into where we're going to go next here, Linnea. If we uh, get our, let's bring this guy over. Um, we can just switch pans. We can show the buccal cavity here. Um, if we look at taking the fish head completely apart and opening it up. So here again is the mouth. If I stick my uh, tool through here, you can see it there wiggling around. This is what we call the, uh, the oral cavity the, or the buccal cavity. And then this is the opercular cavity. The gills have been removed. If a fish swallows a hook, you know, it, it sort of can end up in a few different places. If you're going fishing, oftentimes the hook is hooked somewhere in the lips or the mouth. In some cases, maybe here in, the, in, the, in the, the, the anterior portion of the throat. Every now and then you'll actually get a hook that goes into the esophagus or somewhere in the upper digestive system. And uh, to be honest, fish are pretty resilient. Um, one of the things a lot of biologists look at is, is, is what we call uh, the hooking mortality and survival and things like this. And uh, because hooks are oftentimes made of uh, iron or, or some kind of alloy of iron, uh, they also do eventually rust away. And so sometimes you'll see a fish has been hooked and the hook will rust away. Sometimes you'll see the fish has been hooked and eventually the hook will work its way out. Um, people will recommend, for instance, using things like barbless hooks. So they're easier to work them way out. There's no barb on there that keeps the, 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 the hook embedded in the tissue so that they can actually, the hook can work its way backwards out of the animal. Um, in some cases, it will actually pass through the digestive system. And so I'll say this, fish are remarkably tough to be honest, as far as animals uh, in, in surviving insults, um, such as hooking uh, and physical uh, uh, damage to the body. The one thing that they're actually weak at is surviving osmoregulatory challenges, which is why the kidney is a very important organ, as well as then the gills. Um, and we'll talk about the gills here in a minute, because most fishing mortality, if you catch and release a fish and it dies, Usually it's not because it got hooked. Mostly it's because that fish struggled against you while you're reeling it in. And in doing so, consumed a lot of oxygen. And because it consumed a lot of oxygen, it threw its water balance off. And so oftentimes fish die of shock, what we call osmoregulatory shock. That's gonna be the number one killer of fish. So they're very tough to the hooking mortality uh, in most cases. Some species are a little bit more sensitive than others, but. They can be hooked in a variety of different places, sometimes passing through, sometimes staying in, in place. But as long as that hook doesn't impair its ability to feed, you know, eventually it might work its way loose or rust away. But yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, most mortality of, of catch and release fishing has to do with osmoregulatory stress. Here's the pan again. There we go. Excellent questions, everybody. So. I guess the next one we'll talk about here are the gills. So if we, again, going back to this operculum, this bony cover, again, hard bone protection. Lene is gonna use the, the big shears on this because a little pair of scissors is not gonna cut through that bone uh, very easily. So we're gonna clip it and then just fold it forward. And so while she's cutting that, the uh, underneath that bony plate are the gills. Now, I said to you that this was an advanced fish. It's a striped bass. How do I know that? I've given you several pieces of information. I'm going to give you another one. A bony fish, right? A bony fish meaning that it has bones made of some kind of mineralized compound. 
compared to say a cartilaginous fish of chondrichthys, which would be like a shark or a ray or a skate, which has a cartilage as an endoskeleton. A bony fish is gonna have four gill arches on either side of the head. So four on each side of the head. Uh, as a lasmobranch, like a shark, is gonna have five. Right. And in fact, a lasmobranch means strap gill, which is kind of like a, a flexible rubber band like gill, as opposed to a bony gill. Listen to this. You can hear it. Boom. So these are bony gill arches. Um, a lasmobranch can also have six or seven, but a bony fish is going to have four most Chondrichthyan fishes have five, as many as six or seven. So if we look here at these gill arches, again, protected by this opercular plate, this bony plate, we've got four arches, and this is another anatomical term. Superficial means towards the surface, deep means towards the inside of the organism. So we can count them. One, two, three, and four. The first gill arch is the one that's superficial, the fourth gill arch is the one that's deep towards the inside of the fish. If I can get there, yeah, there. Also, in the case of a striped bass, they've got this weird little like partial gill here. This weird thing, this is called a pseudobranch. Now, the pseudobranch is involved in gas exchange um, and there's a couple ideas here. We really don't know what it does. Our idea is that in certain animals that are highly visual, the eye is a very bioenergetically demanding organ. And so blood goes from the pseudobranch, becomes oxygenated, and then goes directly to, if you hold this back down, Linnea, right to the eye. And so it supplies the retina with highly oxygenated blood. That's one hypothesis. We don't really know for sure why the pseudobranch is there, but that's one idea. If we open this guy back up again, we can see then these gill arches. Now there's two sides to the arch. Um, there's this, this side here that's got this pink, these pink soft filaments. And these are pink because of red blood cells. And then we've got this bony side uh, towards facing the throat. And so we've got some of these gill arches here already dissected out. Here we go. Bring these up. So. <clears throat> These are what we call gill rakers. If we can see these, maybe uh, the contrast here is maybe perhaps better. And see how these, these things are relatively long. Maybe if we move it. Let's see here. These things are relatively long and they're sharp. They're actually sharp, bony features. Now, they sort of face the uh, throat of the fish, and so they're involved in feeding. Whereas these pink elements here of the filaments are involved in gas exchange. So the fish is taking in oxygen, releasing carbon dioxide. And here, this is, these are sharp bony elements because when something goes down the throat of the fish, what these gill rakers do is when the throat closes, they do this. And it prevents anything from trying to swim out, right? You can't go through this like barrier. So that's what those gill rakers do when the fish eat something. And they've got four sets of those that sort of close like a gate. So once you go down the throat of the fish, it's hard to get back out. So it's part of the feeding apparatus. Some fish actually will also filter feed with these. Um, this is a striped bass, so it's not a filter feeder. Uh, but for instance, a paddlefish might have very long, thin, needle-like or comb-like gill rakers where they actually strain water across them and then produce a mucus on there that traps plankton. And they'll then swallow that. Uh, kind of like a whale uses baleen to trap uh, plankton. Uh, paddlefish will use the gill rakers to do that as well. So another, yet another feature you can look at on the anatomy of fish is to tell what it eats. In this particular case, sharp gill rakers uh, indicates that this is probably a carnivore or a piscivore. Because again, this is designed to prevent things from leaving. Another feature of the gas exchange side of the gill is that there's actually two sets of filaments. So it sort of forms a V like this. Um, and what that does is as the fish is passing water over its gills, 
uh, it has twice as much surface area then to perform gas exchange. Again, picking up oxygen uh, and, and releasing carbon dioxide. And I mentioned the other main feature of the gill because the kidney does not get rid of nitrogen waste uh, like in a terrestrial animal. The kidney is primarily dealing with water exchange. The gill is where ammonia is excreted. So people worry about like getting fish pee on their hands. Fish pee in a freshwater fish is mostly water. Putting your hand in the gills is where you're going to get urine on your hands, if you will. <laughs> so I find that, you know, so that's a little thing you can tell your friend. If you're going to get you know, ammonia waste on your hand from a fish, it's going to be under the gill cover. Um, and so those are the, the main features there of the gill. Four arches on either side of the head. And also buried inside of the head here, right next to these gill arches, is the heart. And so, yeah, it's way in there. So it's, 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 it's literally buried all the way inside of the head. The fish heart is like right around here. So we have to cut apart all of this structure here and to save time, we have actually dissected the heart out of another fish. And so here is a heart. Now, the heart of a fish is a little bit, uh, it, 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 the plumbing is designed very similar to that of a, a terrestrial heart like in a human being. There's a couple major differences. Uh, a human being has a four-chambered heart. The fish really has a two-chambered heart. Maybe you could argue a three-chambered heart. They have an atrium. Uh, that receives blood from the, uh, the venous system. Um, and then that atrium then leads into a ventricle, which is a highly muscularized chamber. And then the ventricle then leads into this white structure here. And when I always tell people when they're dissecting a fish, it's pretty easy to see this. Uh, this is just coagulated blood here coming out of the heart. It's pretty easy to see the fish because it's got this distinctive white structure on this, 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 this sac, the ventricle. Now, this white structure is called the, uh, the bulbous arteriosus, and it's a very elastic structure. It, it doesn't contract. The atrium contracts and the ventricle contracts, but the bulbous does not. What the bulbous does is it receives blood exiting the heart. And so as the ventricle contracts, the blood is forced into the bulbous, and there's a one-way valve here that prevents backflow, and then the bulbous swells up. And because it's so elastic, it maintains pressure throughout the arterial system, which then leads straight to the gills. So the plumbing of the fish goes from the heart to the gills to the body, and then from the body back to the heart, gills, body. So that's how it sort of runs. Um, and so again, the heart's delivering the blood there to the gills so that it can be oxygenated. Oxygenated blood then goes to the rest of the body. So that is the heart, and I'd say this, the ventricle, atrium, and a bulbus. So that's why I say that maybe a third, a third chamber, but because the bulbus is not contractile, it's not really considered part of the heart. It's almost a part of the, 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 the arterial vasculature. But really, it's got a, I'd say then an atrium, ventricle, and a bulbus is what is comprising of the heart of a, of a bony fish. Uh, other fishes have a slightly different structure, like a chondrichthyian fish does not have this bulbous. So a shark would not have this white bulbous structure on the heart. It has what's called a conus arteriosus, which is a slightly different in structure and function, but the purpose of it is very similar, is to maintain pressure in the arterial system. Um, and so if we go to uh, the buccal cavity now, we let's hold this guy up just real quick to see a good shot down the throat. So if we open up that fish, and you can see down the throat of that fish, you can see then, let me stand up here for a minute to look down myself. You can sort of see these gill rakers pointing uh, the direction that they are. Um, and so some prey item is coming down into the throat. Um, this again is the oral cavity, the buccal cavity. Uh, and then the esophagus here, which connects to the stump. Now, um, that's sort of like maybe the last thing that a, a fathead minnow might see or a, a gizzard shad or something uh, as you're going down the throat of a striped bass. <clears throat> but really, there are some specialized structures in here. So we talked about the importance of the, uh, the oral jaws as far as an advanced 
feeding apparatus for fishes. Really, when I look at the diversity of fishes, this jaw really is what sort of set the stage for animals to be uh, dominant on the planet as far as vertebrates because of this invention. But this is the oral jaw, and the oral jaw can have teeth. So I'm going to scrape this so you can hear. So there are teeth on both the mandible and the premaxilla. And so, again, this is, knowing that this is a carnivore that eats other fish, these teeth here are designed to capture prey. So the idea is the teeth here, along with the gill rakers, is designed to get something into your mouth and keep it from getting away. Now, the fish has to then deal with that thing. It's got a live thing in its mouth. How do we kill that thing and start digesting it? And that's where the pharyngeal teeth come into place. What? Yes. Fish actually have two jaws. They have an oral jaw, and they have a pharyngeal jaw inside of the skull. So if you lay that fish down, Linnea, the pharyngeal jaw is going to be right around here. The pharyngeal jaw is going to be located right about here. And this is analogous to the molar teeth in the back of your jaw. They are hard, bony plates that literally are designed to pulverize stuff. So again, the oral jaw is trapping something and making sure it doesn't get out, while then this pharyngeal jaw is crushing it. And so that's why things like insects or shellfish, like uh, crustaceans and uh, clams and things like that. You have fish that are specialized to eat these structures uh, and they actually just will take a, a, a shell like a snail for instance into its mouth and the pharyngeal jaw will crush that snail into it'll grind it up and so you can actually pulverize some of these harder structures with these pharyngeal teeth. So here is our fish that's already cut open. We've got the head split open and the pharyngeal jaw, oh there it is. So this is the pharyngeal jaw tooth pad. So we've cut apart the uh, gill arches. We've got a handful of the remnants here. You can sort of see some of these gill rakers. Uh, this is the tooth pad that then sits at the base of the skull that's part of that inside pharyngeal jaw. And so listen to this. It's a hard bony structure. And there's one of these tooth pads on the dorsal aspect of the fish, as well as then on the ventral aspect, which there's a part of it that still remains here. And so inside of the throat of that fish, these things literally are opposed like this. And so when some prey item comes in, these things crunch it like that. And so that is the pharyngeal jaw. Now you can tell a lot by what a fish eats based upon the size of that. In the case of a striped bass, it's got like a it's got a mediocre pharyngeal jaw. You know, striped bass might eat something like a, a blue crab that's just recently molted, but they're not really designed to eat very heavy shellfish. Um, a snail cracker, for instance, is a regular sunfish. It's a freshwater fish. It's a very well-developed pharyngeal jaw because they literally eat things like snails. And so their pharyngeal jaw is designed to crush snail shells. So uh, the fish will use this second jaw just like you use the rear teeth in your jaw, your molars. So that's the pharyngeal jaw. So that's another fact you can tell your friends. Fish, in fact, have two jaws, an oral jaw and a pharyngeal jaw. <clears throat> and I believe that is, yes, the eye. So let's look at the eye of the fish. This is probably one of our last structures that we'll talk about and then open it up for some questioning. Now, <clears throat> this eye, is, 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 is it's a camera eye, so it's just like camera eye, meaning uh, it can take a, an image uh, as opposed to just being sensitive to light, like presence or absence. It actually can see an image. And so the eye in, in its design is very similar to that of an eye of a terrestrial animal, such as a human being. And you can sort of see it's got complete control. It can, the fish can look all around its body um, and things like this. <clears throat> now, the one thing that's interesting to note is the, the, the shape of the pupil of the eye is kind of teardrop shaped, uh, or what we call an elliptical eye. And that's because the fish is, <clears throat> is designed so that its eyes are placed on the side of its head. And that elliptical eye sort of says, I'm looking at something in front of me. 
but also at the same time, I want to see as far down the side of my body as possible. So they can almost like sort of their peripheral vision, they can sort of almost see their tail. Not quite. The one place that they have a very significant blind spot is directly in front of their eyes. So they, just like you trying to touch your nose and see your finger, you can't see that. Well, fish is blind spots even a little bit further out. And that's because the trade-off is that their eyes are on the side of the head, whereas ours are on the front of our head. And so the part of the reason also why there's that, that, that lateral line, that acoustical lateralis system I explained about feeling sound, there's a lot of lateral line sense in the head because once the fish gets close enough to something, it can no longer see it. It's actually kind of blind. So it would use a lateral line oftentimes to, to, to detect it. But the elliptical shape of the eye has to do with the way the fish sees and also the fact that the refractive index of water is different from that of the atmosphere, right? We live in, uh, what, 20 something percent oxygen, 70 something percent nitrogen and then everything else is traced. We live in a very uh, oxygen, nitrogen rich atmosphere. The fish lives in water. And water is in fact much more dense than a gas. And so the refractive index as light moves through water or changes its interface when it comes from the atmosphere into water, it bends the light. And so that means the, the shape of the eye and the shape of the lens of the eye need to be different to accommodate that shift in light. So their eye actually has a very different shaped lens compared to that of a terrestrial animal like a human. And so the, the shape of the eye lens for a human being is what we call elliptical. It's kind of like, it's not a sphere, it's sort of a bent sphere. The shape of the eye lens of a fish is a perfectly round sphere. It's a crystal ball looking, and it's perfectly spherical. And that's because a sphere is the strongest prism that you can have to bend light through it. And that's because literally the refractive index in water is required in order to see, in, in order to focus an image coming into your pupil or the fish's pupil onto the retina to get a clear image, the eye has to have a spherical lens. So if you cut the eye of the fish out and dissect it, you will find in fact a completely spherical lens inside that eye having to do again then with the refractive index of water and how it is so different from that of air. So it's a very strong prism. And so that is in fact uh, the prism, the lens of a fish eye, perfectly spherical. They're very cool um, and they're very tough actually. So you can always uh, dissect out then the, uh, the lens of the fish eye. Um, and so with that, I believe those were the majority of the features that we were going to cover here. Um, and I think that we've done a uh, very good justice there. Um, so, is that there? Okay, excellent. And so are there any questions there uh, on any of these things that we have going over? I'll pause for a little bit of time to see if anybody wants to type something into the chat. And general question for you though, I mean, it's hard for you to um, demonstrate this, but what would be some of the key differences if this were a male fish versus a female fish that we have today? Oh, very good. So here we go, we bring back this ovary. Now, um, the uh, male fish is going to have a gonad, uh, uh, the testis, much smaller than this structure. It's gonna be, uh, it, you know, this fish is ready to spawn. So it's still gonna be relatively big uh, here because the fish is getting ready to spawn. So not quite as big as this. So if I'm gonna say this is my thumb, I'm gonna say the testis might be my index finger in size. So slightly smaller. And also instead of it being this, uh, this yellowish color full of, again, when we cut this thing open and we see this sort of um, granular material in there. Uh, these sort of folds on the inside of the ovary are called lamellae. This testis is gonna be white. It will be a perfectly cream colored white. And that's because uh, the semen uh, or spermatozoa or milt of a fish is white. Uh, and so it will not be yellow, it will be white or cream colored. And typically speaking, instead of having all this highly vascularized network of blood vessels uh, along it, um, you can see, even see that when I moved the, the probe on there, you can sort of see the blood maybe 
uh, in those vessels. The testis usually has a single artery running down the middle of it. And to be honest, uh, it looks kind of like a thick rubber band. It doesn't look like what we call a sausage shaped. It's a little bit flatter and thinner. And so the testis is oftentimes like a, you know, a rubber band shaped, single large red vessel running down the middle, a white color, as opposed to uh, this kind of yellowish uh, color with a lot of vasculature. And the other thing is, is when you cut open the ovary, you'll see this granular kind of ovarian lamellae, which contain all the clutches of the oocytes. Um, if this fish is ovulated, you'd slit it open and all the eggs would be loose. They pour out. The testis, when you cut it open, is filled with a creamy, it looks like milk. It literally looks like milk. Uh, and that is a sperm in there. Uh, they, they are free swimming around in there. So it looks like milk when you slice open a testis. And so those are the two major differences, I would say, between a male and a, a female fish that is reproductive capabilities, such as this timing of the year for strike bass. Thanks so much. And another question I want to come back to has to do with age. How old do these fish get? And how, what are some methods that you use to age a fish? Very good. So there's a couple ways we can do that. A fish like this, I believe is, uh, again, this one was reared in captivity. So these are, I think about three years old or so. A fish from the wild is gonna be uh, smaller than this because again, these things are fed a nice prepared diet. They don't have to go out and, and collect their own food. We just provide it for them. And so these captive reared fish are gonna be a little bigger. A striped bass can live quite a long time. You know, you're looking at, I'm going to say 20 years or more even uh, for a striped bass. And so um, I don't recall what the actual world record striped bass is, but I know that, you know, you can catch 20 to 50 pound striped bass off the coast of North Carolina, so they can get relatively large. In captivity, the fish we breed, a four-year-old female is going to be over five kilograms, which means it's in the 10 to 12 pound range in about four years when we're in captivity. Um, these fish here were reared in captivity, but we did not give them uh, uh, as much of a diet. Um, these really are fish that we sort of just hold on to for scientific purposes. We're not trying to grow them as fast as possible, but, you know, a uh, uh, fish in captivity can, could reach 10 pounds in four years. Um, and so in the wild, uh, one of the things we do to age fish, you know, I sort of know how old this fish is because um, we spawned it. We, we made this fish uh, three years ago. So we sort of know that, that that was its birth date. But if we didn't know that, what we could do is we could take things out of the animal. So for instance, one of them that we can do is we can take a scale. And the scale grows by laying down rings on it. And so as the fish gets bigger, um, the scale will get bigger. And it will grow and add rings to it, just like uh, the rings of a tree. So you can actually count rings of the scale and you can come up with some mathematical equation for this fish. And you can say, for instance, plot the length of the fish by the number of rings. And you can come up with some kind of uh, equation to predict the age of that animal based upon that relationship. That's why sometimes the rings of the, uh, the, the scale are called annuli, annual meaning year. Um, another way to do it, and I don't know if we can get it out of here, Linnea, is the odorless. If we if you can try to crack the skull of the fish. I'm gonna do a longer process. That is tough. So we'll see if we can get this done, uh, if we can. It's hard to do without really, yeah, there's somewhere in there. So I told you about how fish can hear with stones in their skull. Uh, just like you have stones in your skull, uh, what happens is a, a sound wave comes in and uh, that sound wave passes through some material that's dense. And in doing so, it causes that material to vibrate. And then you've got some kind of structure around that stone that understands what that vibration means and sends some signal to the brain and the brain then interprets it. So in addition to the acoustical lateralis system, the fish has these stones inside of the skull, uh, three of them on either side of the head. And those stones, in one case, one of them is actually relatively big. Uh, it's about the size for a fish like this, maybe slightly smaller than a fingernail. Uh, and what you do is you can take that stone out of the head and you can uh, cut it. Uh, use a, you can use a diamond saw to slice that in half. And inside of that stone are gonna be rings, 
just like the rings on the scale. And you can count the rings on that stone because every year the fish is going to put down another layer uh, as it grows older. And so you can count the rings of those stones. And those stones are called otoliths. Uh, lith is meaning stone and oto is ear. So the, the ear stones. Um, and so there's a large otolith inside of the skull then that you can also use to age fish, um, as well as in looking at things like the scales. We might not be able to get it because it's sort of a tough one to find um, on the fly, if you will. Any other questions there? While Anaya is working on that, uh, something that uh, a few people are a little bit curious about is Say a uh, fish goes extremely deep. I, I'm not sure if striped bass are much of deep water fish, but would a deep water fish have differences with that bladder that you showed or other different structural changes? That's a very good, that's a very good thing to ask. And actually there's a lot of research on that. And so, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the physostome, is a fish that has the swim bladder attached to the esophagus. So if it wants to fill that swim bladder, all it has to do is go to the surface and gulp. Now that's fine if you're a fish that lives at the surface of the water, right? You're only like five feet below the surface. Oh, look, I wanna change my buoyancy. I'm gonna go up to the surface and gulp a little air. Yep, that's enough. If I take too much, I just burp it out. That's fine if you're right by the surface, but what if you are a fish that lives at like 5,000 feet deep. Are you gonna swim all the way to the surface to fill your swim bladder? No. So that's sort of how and why the physoclysis swim bladder evolved was to allow deep sea fishes the ability to also regulate their buoyancy. Now, it just so happens that the, that's, uh, it just so happens that the the striped bass itself doesn't live so deep, but other fishes do. Um, I'm trying to think right now, groupers and things like that, that people will catch uh, at some depth. And what they'll do is uh, they'll hook that fish and bring it up to the surface. And in doing so, uh, the pressure at like say 500 feet deep is a lot different than at the surface. And so what will happen is, is that swim bladder will expand. Uh, and actually, in some cases, it can expand out through the throat of the mouth, uh, out through the, the, the mouth of the fish. And so uh, that is a, a, an area of research. Um, and people do look at that. And so a lot of times what people say is if you're going to catch and release uh, deep sea fishes that you're hooking, uh, oftentimes they'll tell you to take a probe or something like this, like a needle. And they'll tell you to actually literally poke the, a hole in the side of the fish to deflate that or poke a hole in the swim bladder to deflate that. Uh, because they don't tell you to stuff it back in the mouth, but they'll tell you that if you release it like that, the fish will somehow sort itself out. And so deflating the swim bladder is, is things that people look at uh, doing, and that's because of this pressure differential uh, for bringing a fish at a deep sea to the surface. In the case of a physostomus fish, uh, they don't really have to worry because when they're brought to the surface rapidly, they just burp and all the air is released. The physoclites, because of this uh, non-attachment to the esophagus, they cannot do that. So they're sort of at the mercy of physics, uh, which means that as you re remove the pressure, uh, you increase the volume, right? This is uh, intro, it's chemistry, right? Um, Boyle's law and things like that. So that is a concern there. And I do know that uh, they have uh, done studies of bringing fish into outer space. And that's one of the things they do is actually pop the swim bladder uh, to deal then with the uh, uh, pressure difference between, for instance, gravity at the surface of the earth and atmospheric pressure versus that in uh, zero gravity. Um, and so they have done studies looking at the uh, effects there. It's very interesting. But yes, that is a concern with, a, uh, with that advanced swim bladder. Next question. That's really it. Any, any luck on that otolith there, Linnea? No, but I'm you struggling. <laughs> you have to literally carve it out of the skull. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you find it, it's just a really tiny white I, dot. I didn't start with this enough. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a little chip. It looks literally like a, a, a little chip of marble or something like that. They're usually very white or crystalline looking. 
uh, and it literally is a little chip. Um, and so typically I've always usually got like a couple of them sitting in a tube of ethanol that we can just show. But um, to be honest, uh, you know, a surrogate is one of these right here. Because for a fish this size, I'm going to say that any of these these dried up scales in this wave boat right here would probably be what it would look like uh, without magnification. Um, and so they'd be about that size. And you would then just take that and take a little Dremel saw and cut it and then count the rings in it. And in this case, for a, a fish like this, it'd be one, two, three, three rings. It's probably a three-year-old fish. So you count up the rings just like you count the rings on a tree. Well, awesome. We'll, we'll see if, <laughs> I don't want to go away because Lene is putting in so much effort here. Uh, but I'll just, oh, it's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the time uh, to just say thank you to everybody um, who's tuned in. Uh, we had loads of great questions, lots of great engagement here, folks. So thank you for that. Uh, in the world of applied ecology here at NC State, we have several other events that are coming up, including a bee hotel build along where we're gonna to get together with the folks at the library to build our own bee hotels just in time for the spring. We have our fermentology series that happens every other week to talk about all things fermented food, wine, bread, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, we'll be doing more dissections like this and other events as we progress in the year. Um, so thanks to Linnea and Ben so much for your time. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and asked all of your great questions. And I'll be sending out an email to everybody who attended with a link to the YouTube um, broadcast. So if you want to go back and check out some parts that you didn't see, um, you'll have it there for you. So that's, that's all for me. How's it going down there? It's going. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>